Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Lisa Blackburn. This is my YouTube channel where we talk about everything I want to science and math. And today we are doing unit four in chemistry about bonds, part two. And what we started with was we did a little activity with Lewis structures where we use laminate sheets and Cheerios to make Lewis structures. And how you do that is you see how many columns over an element is, not counting the transition metals. You put a dot around each side for every column. And then once you've done more than four, you double up. So that's Lewis structures. We did it with Cheerios. It was delicious. Sorry you weren't here. Uh, and now we're talking about how you translate that from Lewis structures to formulas. And what you do is you look and see what the ion charge is, what, uh, what charge they have as an ion. And then you, if you just crisscross them and make these superscript subscripts, then you can see what the formula will be. So this one, calcium is plus two, fluorine is minus one, so calcium fluoride is, you cross them, it's CA1F2, subscript two, but you don't write ones because we want to be cool like math and have understood ones. And now we're learning how to name them. And the names are based on the IUPAC, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And it is, you name the cation, the metal, the positive part first. Then you name the um, non-metal, but you change the ending to IDE. So it's not sodium chlorine, it's sodium chloride. All right, now you're all caught up. So uh, for those who are out, that was fast. Ask me if it was too fast. Okay, so now for everybody else. See if we can name this thing. A-L-B-R-3. What would its first name be? Yes, Sam? Aluminum. Aluminum and its last name? You said it? Bromide, right. It's aluminum bromide. So this is easy, isn't it? Aluminum bromide. It's not aluminum bromine, it's aluminum bromide. Okay, how about we already did NaCl. What is it? Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Now, You've read packages, you've looked at the back and read the ingredients, and it's not quite that simple. There's a little more to it. So there's a, one other thing. The first thing is polyatomic. There are uh, atoms that act together as, their, as one ion. For example, oxygen and hydrogen can bond to each other and then they get a charge and they act like one ion. It's called hydroxide. So it has a little bit different name. Polyatomics, the names are the names on the chart. So there is a chart of these and they have names. And it is, I think on the periodic table I gave you, but it's on the periodic table that you get on test. If you look at the back, there's a box this says selected polyatomic ions. And so if you look on here, um, H3O acts together and it's called hydronium. NH4 acts together and it's ammonium. So these are ones that have different names and they're polyatomic. Poly means many. So there are more than one atom acting together to become an ion. Can you imagine that? Okay, so we are, um, last year I made the kids have a pop quiz on the polyatomic ions and memorize some. I haven't totally decided if we're doing that or not. I will tell you. So what do I say? Yeah, it says you'll have a quiz on this. See, I made them do it last year. You'll probably have a quiz on this, but don't study it yet. Because I feel like usually kids end up learning it. Thank you. Kids end up learning it just by using them, and you don't really have to, to memorize them. So I'll think about that. You might not have to do it. Okay, the other thing is, what about those transition metals? Remember I told you you skip them, all of these in the middle here? Well, theirs is a little bit different. They can have, they can make more than one ion, okay? Some of these, it always makes the same ion. And if you look on my periodic table, I've written them on here. See this little green sticky thing? Cadmium is always plus two. So there's a few, and I'm gonna write it back on here. The 
that are always just one thing. But a lot of the ancient metals, see how I got my little ancient Latin guy here? A lot of the ancient metals can make more than one ion. And how they used to designate it was with their Latin names. So you, if you've ever looked at the back of your um, toothpaste, it says stannous fluoride. Tin can be stannic or stannous, depending on which ion it's making. Um, a lot of these, copper, it can, you'll see cupric, ferric, ferrous, that's the um, iron one. So these ancient metals have more than one state, and I'm going to give you a list of them of what state, uh, of what the ions are that they can make. So some metals, that says male, it should say make more than one ion. Let me find my notes and make sure I'm filling it in the way I wanted them filled in. Where did I put them? I had notes. I'll put them right there. There they are. Doop, doop, doop. Okay. Um, so, oh, let me give you an example here for polyatomic. An example for polyatomic that you might have seen is NaOH. That sodium hydroxide, have you ever heard of that chemical? It's also lye. Have you ever heard of lye soap? Is, is that's what it is, NaOH, sodium hydroxide. Okay, so some metals are ancient and they can make more than one ion. They're not always a certain charge. But still, the, and how you tell it is the cation, the metal, is followed by a Roman numeral. Remember learning Roman numerals? When did y'all do that? I learned it in third grade. When did y'all learn them? Did y'all learn th Roman numerals and I is one, two I's is two, three I's is three? Y'all never learned that? Uh-oh, it must have got taken out of the standards. They didn't know. We still use it in chemistry. Uh, I, V is four, a uh, V is five, V, I is six, V, I, I is seven, V, I, I, I is eight, I, X is nine, and X is ten. That's about all you need to know. I will write that down for y'all on the ancient metal sheets. So some of y'all have not learned Roman numerals. Things that we used to learn, they don't always teach now. All right, that was a big movement in the 90s in education. They said that we were teaching too many things shallow. We needed to teach fewer things deeper. I don't know that it worked, but that's what they did. Okay, then, so that's what, that's the way that's considered the uh, accepted way is that you put this Roman numeral after the metal to tell what charge it is. So if it is got a Roman numeral two, that means its charge that it makes is plus two. If it had a Roman numeral three, its charge it would make would be plus three. That's the way that is supposed to be the way we do it now. But, when, so in the 80s, the dark ages of the 80s, when I learned this, they said there was an old way to do it based on their Latin names, the whole stannic fluoride thing, instead of doing 10 Roman numeral fluoride. But just like how they lied, say when we were switching to the metric system in the 70s, they lied about this. So when I was your age in high school and they said, this is the old way, we don't use that anymore, I didn't bother learning it got to college and everybody was using it. They still use it to this day. It never went away. Just like how feet and pounds and miles didn't go away, the old Roman no names for this hasn't gone away. Clifford, put away your phone. No phones, pay attention. Chemistry's hard. This part in particular is a little bit hard, this Roman numerals and Roman names stuff. All right, I'm gonna scroll this up. And I'll show you a little bit more about how it's done. But you're going to do a worksheet on that will help also. Please roll, please roll, please roll. It's not good. Oh, yeah, it's doing it. Okay, so they also can have a different name based on its Latin name. So Roman numerals or Latin names. For example, iron has two different ions. It can be iron three, so that's Roman numeral three, or it could be iron two. If it's iron three, that means that it has a, a charge of plus three. If it's iron two, that means its charge is plus two. 
Okay, and we'll learn more about this. We'll learn more about their ancient names. Okay, when ionic compounds form, they are arranged in crystal lattices. Crystal lattices. So when you see crystals like geodes and things like that, um, we go into the New Age store and they've got the crystal necklaces and stuff. Though you know that it's an ionic compound because they make crystals. So salt is an ionic compound. Salt makes crystals, doesn't it? If you ever looked at salt up close, they're tiny little bitty squares, little bitty cubes. You ever looked at them real closely and saw that? It's interesting, isn't it? One, one just little thing like uh, sodium chloride, one little unit is called a unit cell. And if you take AP chemistry, we will learn a lot more about this. We're not going to spend too much time with it, but come back for AP, not next year, but the year after. You can take AP chemistry, get college credit for it, do new things, take a hard test. It'll be awesome. <laughs> okay, AP chem. It's fun. I took it in high school. It was fun. I liked it. We did uh, uh, really interesting labs. Okay. Now, some, okay, some are called the unit cell. Um, we are going, to, ionic compounds versus covalent compounds have certain characteristics that you have to know for the test. I'll say something like makes crystals, and you say ionic, okay? So we're going to do a lab, though. I don't want to tell you the answer. I want you to discover the answer in the lab. So we're going to learn the characteristics of ionic compounds in lab. Then you need to go back after the lab and list the, the characteristics here because there'll be a lot of test questions on this. It's an easy way for me to throw 15 questions at you. Uh, you know, match, ionic, covalent. And I like to give you a lot of questions. You figured that out by now so that you can get a lot of them wrong and still get an A. Uh, I'm still a little mad at the physics professor I had at Georgia State who only gave us four questions, no partial credit. I told y'all that. You either make a 100, a 75, a 50, a 25, or a zero. No partial credit. I think he was lazy. He didn't want a grade, but still a little mad at him. Okay, now the other thing I told you is that some are constant. So we'll leave this here. We'll write it here. Some are constant and I want you to write this on your cheat sheet periodic table silver is always plus one cadmium is always plus two and zinc is always plus two so I want you to write those on your periodic table you'll be able to use that periodic table on the test and that way you don't have to memorize them. Or you can memorize them if you just want to. Feel free. Okay? Now, there are some, so one of the things I used to teach this uh, in the book that we had. Y'all don't have books, but we had a book. And it talked about how in the earth there are these, like, giant geodes. They're called salt domes. And they're these caverns in the earth full of salt crystals. And it's very, very stable. And in this book, they said it would be a good idea to, it's a place where we can put nuclear waste to store it. Because, you know, nobody wants the nuclear power plant waste stored in their backyard and give you cancer and give your kids birth defects and they cook you like a hot dog from the inside out. So nobody wants that. It's why I'm kind of against nuclear power now. I think ever since they had the uh, earthquake in Japan that cracked open the nuclear power plant and it's killing so many people in America and Japan, uh, I just think that it's too dangerous, that we're a little arrogant. But you can make up your own mind about that. But their idea was it was a place where we could put this leftover nuclear waste. Mr. Myrick is actually a geologist. His degree is in geology. I don't know a whole lot about geology. I was a chem major, not geology. He has a master's degree in geology. And he said, no, 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 no. They're not that stable. They would not be good for nuclear power. But he said what they do store in them, and that's why we have the little nuclear symbol. Do you have it on yours or did I take it off? I didn't want to confuse you. I might take it off. So anyway, what the reason, he said what they store in them is extra oil. They're down in the Gulf 
underneath the Gulf, and they'll put the the federal oil reserves in it, and that it is it's okay to store in there. Cause you know, like the ocean floor naturally has places where oil just leaks out into the ocean, and the ocean can clean it. Like when they've had oil spills and stuff, it's bad at first. It like kills the fish and the birds and stuff. But given time, the ocean can actually break down oil. It's part of nature. So that's kind of cool, isn't it? So he said no. So it's a good place for, according to Mr. Myrick, oil storage, not nuclear waste. He says the book is wrong. And I trust him. I trust him. I think he's right. Okay, so ionic bonds are when electrons are transferred, and you learned that in physical science in eighth grade, didn't you? So the other one is covalent bonds. What did they do? Do you remember eighth grade physical science? What do they do with their bonds? They share them. It's between, and they're between two non-metals. So that's how one way you know. They're between two non-metals. And they share an electron pair. They share two, not just one. They each contribute one electron to share, and then that makes the bond. So example is methane. Okay, so now, I'm going to try to scroll up. We'll see if it'll let me do it. I'll do lots of clicking like I did last time. Ah, that worked. Aha. Uh -huh. Oops. All right. So I said time to learn carbon's real Lewis structure. It's not really the real Lewis structure. It's the orbital diagram. When we did the orbital diagram for carbon, okay, so... How many valence electrons does carbon have? How many squares over is it? Four. And if we did the whole thing, how many electrons does it have? What's its atomic number? Six, right. So if we were going to do the electron configuration or orbital diagram for carbon, the first two would go into the 1s orbital. The next two we said went into the 2s orbital, and then we said that the next two went into the 2p orbital. That's the way you learned it last unit, correct? Lies. I taught you something that wasn't true because you weren't ready for it yet. Turns out there are some exceptions, and carbon is one of them. Atoms, remember it's all about what makes them happy. They all want eight, remember that? But the other thing is, is their orbitals, they would, some atoms would rather have two half-filled orbitals than one partially filled orbital. And carbon is one of these. So this is what really happens. Okay, go back here. All right, so this is what it really does. It does, the first two do go into the 2s. The next one goes in, into the 1s. The next one goes into the, to the 2s, but then the, ne the next three all jump up to 2p. So that's why the Lewis structure of carbon is four dots, one on each side, ready to make a bond. Carbon can make four bonds because of this. If carbon wasn't a rule breaker and didn't do this, making two half-filled orbitals instead of uh, this one being filled and that one partial, we wouldn't have life. Well, I told you how life is based on water. Life is also based on carbon doing this. Because carbon can make four bonds, then it is be you can make millions of chemicals out of it, the chemicals needed for life. It's why you are a carbon-based life form, because carbon's a rule breaker. Does that make a little bit of sense to you? Okay, so carbon is the king of the covalent compounds. Carbon, remember how we skipped it? Its family was, a, was the skip, because they don't do ionic. They only do covalent. They have recently, in the last couple of years, forced carbon to do some plus four and minus four ions. They've been able to use it for a cancer treatment, but 
In nature, carbon doesn't do this. Carbon always shares, okay? And they make four bonds, okay? So here's an example one. You could have carbon, I mean, let me, I'll go back to red. You have carbon, and here is its Lewis, its Lewis structure, its dot structure, and it can work out sharing arrangements with hydrogen. So here is hydrogen with its dot structures. Sit and draw real good, but you can kind of see it. So you can see how the hydrogens each put in their one dot, their one Cheerio. The carbon's got its four Cheerios, and it lets it make four bonds, four covalent bonds where it is sharing its electrons. Now, I know hydrogen is over there with the metals, but hydrogen isn't really a metal. Um, it has, it's, not, it's not ductile. It's not malleable. It doesn't conduct heat and electricity. It, it's really, so sometimes on some periodic tables, it'll be floating above all the other elements in the middle, like a demigod above the earth. So anyway, so sometimes you'll see it over there. So don't think of, think of hydrogen as a non-metal. Okay, so that is the structure of methane. Now, where do we find methane in real life? Where's methane? Yes, it's when you pass gas, it's what you pass. So here we have a beautiful atomic drawing of a fart. Uh, but also, it's the gas if you have natural gas at your home. I live too far out in the country. We don't have natural gas. But if you're a, a city slicker and you've got natural gas in your home, then it's methane. Now, why does the, the poots smell bad and the methane in your house does not smell like a poot? It's, it has a smell, but it doesn't smell like a poot. Have you ever noticed that? It's because real methane, pure methane, has no smell at all. What makes poot smell is the bacteria in your gut is what you're smelling with the poots. You're smelling bacteria. And in your home, the smell of methane is they add it to it in case there's a gas leak so you could smell it and get out of there. Uh, maybe 15 years ago or so, um, there was a home in Austell that had a gas leak. They didn't realize it. The mom and kids had left. The dad got home from work, walked into the house, and there was a spark, and it blew up the house in him. He died. If only he had smelled it quicker and gotten out of there, because he got, I mean, the house was like matchsticks. I saw it. It was right next to Orange Hill Baptist Church in Austell, and it was, the house was just, everything was tiny little slivers of wood. It was just all gone. It was crazy. It's like a bomb had gone off. So anyway, that's methane. It can be dangerous. Oh, and the question I always ask is, since it's flammable, can you light poots? Yes, you can. Should you? No, you cannot. You should not, because uh, you can get very badly burned in a very sensitive part of your body. So, but yes, poots can burn. All right, so now the other thing is they usually do not share the electron equally. Now, just like in real divorces, remember these are our divorced parents. Real divorced parents don't usually have, you don't usually go to mom's on Monday, dad on Tuesday, mom on Wednesday, dad on Thursday, right? It's not like that. I've only known of one student I had years ago who actually did that. The parents had bought houses next door to each other in the same neighborhood, and the kid did that. Monday mom, Tuesday dad, they just every other day switched. To me, it seems a little hard on the kid. Like, it'd be a little hard, but they did that. So usually, just like in real divorces, one parent usually has custody of the child more, and with the elements, it's the same one. Remember how we learned that word, electronegativity, the ability to attract an electron to oneself? The, the more electronegative the atom, then it gets the electron more. So with carbon is much more electronegative than hydrogen. It gets the electrons more and hydrogen gets them less. Now they are shared sometimes completely equal, but it's when they are bonded to themselves. Let me find my notes, see how I wrote this. Uh, uh, here we go. Yes, when they are bonded to an identical atom. That's how I said it. An example of this is diatomic model molecules like hydrogen 
bonds to itself to make hydrogen gas. Nitrogen bonds to itself right here. 80% of what we're breathing in right now is that nitrogen gas. Oxygen gas, that's the other 20%. Uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So that's our, uh, our blue. These are mostly, these are gases, except the bromine and the iodide. So that's why we have a balloon there. Now, you have to memorize these. This is something chemistry students have to know, is which ones are the diatomic molecules. It's not hard because it makes sort of a number seven. Look on the periodic table. It's hydrogen over here, and then you go over here to nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, acetone was two, but it's not real. See how its little mass is in parentheses? That means it doesn't hold together long enough to get a real mass. Does that make sense? So these are the ones you need to memorize plus hydrogen. Those are the diatomic molecules. They only bond to themselves. Di means two. Atomic means atom. Two atom molecule. How do we feel about that? Can you see the seven and learn it? Okay. And see how many there are? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It works out. Okay, sometimes also it can bond to itself. Carbon likes to bond to itself, and it's because it's so good at bonding. It's, remember I told you it's the king of sharing, covalent? So it bonds to itself. It's not diatomic. Carbon doesn't just bond to itself like that. Um, you, normally it would have some hydrogens bonded to it also. So it's not one of the diatomic elements. Okay, so what I told you was the more electronegative, the more electronegative atom gets the electron more. It's like usually the mom gets the baby more, right? Not always. This causes the atom to have positive and negative ends, so it's called polar, just like how the Earth has a globe and it has ends to it, uh, the North Pole and the South Pole, the molecule will have to ends to it. Okay, now this might make you feel kind of smart. We're gonna learn a little bit more Greek letter stuff, okay? The positive and negative region of a covalent compound is called a dipole moment. It sounds like a moment where you're drinking coffee, a, a moment to relax. But no, it's called a dipole, di two, two pole moments. And they have symbols for it. Oops, take that off. More fun with sound effects. Okay, and so this is a lowercase, did I get it? A lowercase Greek letter delta. Remember the uppercase delta is the triangle. The lowercase delta looks Kind of like an eight that's not finished. Looks like that, okay? So these are the symbol for partial positive and negative charges. It's not a whole positive, neg positive and negative charge like these are. These are whole charges, big, strong ionic charges for the ionic. But for the covalent, they will have on part of the atom will have a region with a positive or negative charge. So if it's positive, it gets a little plus. If it's negative, it gets a little negative. Another way they will show this is with an arrow. And uh, the that end is the positive end of the arrow, and this end is the negative end of the arrow. So they'll draw an arrow across the atom showing where the charges are. And you always have both. You don't have positive without negative. Jake, paying attention? Put your phone away. This is confusing. We just talked about Greek letters. You have to pay attention. So an example is water. This is water. I used to say it was unimpressed Mickey Mouse. The oxygen is negative. It's the hog. It's the more electronegative one. The hydrogens are positive. They are less electronegative. There's two hydrogens for every one oxygen in water. You know water's H2O, right? So, so if we were to draw this, then we could draw like, I'll do it over here. We could draw it like this, 
and the positive, the center of the positive is between these ears. So I would draw a little Greek positive sign there and a negative sign there. So that's one way of showing that that's the positive side of water, that's the negative side. Another way to do it is you draw the arrow. Oops. So the positive, oops, the positive is here and we draw the arrow to the negative side like that. So that's another way to do it is to draw the arrow through it. So sometimes on tests you have to draw the arrow, sometimes you have to draw them with the little Greek letters. How do we feel about that? Now I've had students say, no, it's not Mickey Mouse, it's Kermit the Frog. What do you think, Kermit the Frog or Mickey Mouse? Uh, and see, those letters sort of look like he's dead. So it's dead Kermit the Frog or unimpressed Mickey Mouse. They kind of do, don't they? Now, whether a bond is considered covalent or ionic is not just one or the other. It's based on a scale. It's based on a numerical rating that you find in the chart. So there can, you know, things can be... A, they can kind of share and kind of transfer. So you look on these charts to figure it out. Now, the next idea is bond angles, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to pause the video because we're going to do something else hands-on, okay? So uh, we'll be back in a second, and I'll explain to you what we did. Like, share, subscribe.